I've called all you folks together because for the next couple of hundred miles we're going to be traveling through Ute country. That means that we have to be extra careful. Bridget used to say to me, boy, you keep your eyes peeled for them pesky Utes. That's good advice. So for the next couple of hundred miles, I want you to stay very close together. No stragglers. And there'll be no hunting. You never know what might set them off. I'm not trying to scare you, Pete. I just want you to realize that this is a very dangerous stretch of ground. And like Bridges said, I want you to keep your eyes peeled. It's supposed to be beautiful in these parts, but I don't suppose I've ever really seen it. I'm always looking past the scenery for trouble, Indian trouble. If you ever heard a war cry split a summer afternoon, you never forget it. And you meet a lot of ghosts along this trail. I guess that's why it's come to be called the Trail of Death. And when it's finally behind you, they have a real celebration. Well, I can't think when I've seen everyone so happy. Even Mr. Pringle is smiling. Look at him. <laughs> His face is going to crack any minute. <laughs> you know, I never saw my husband dance before. My, he's good. <laughs> and he's got something to kick his heels about. He was afraid your time had come before we left youth country. I told him the baby wouldn't be born until Denver. I'm just sure of it. <laughs> well, it's always a great relief to get through the youth country. Well, it seems so peaceful and quiet. Was it really as dangerous as that? Well, I lost 11 wagons the last time I came through. 11 wagons and 23 lives. <laughs> Well, I reckon we're luckier than we knew. I reckon. You know, every time I do any square dancing, I always feel like I'm off feet. You do. <laughs> every woman in camp had her eyes on you. Even those of us that could be your grandmother. Is that a proposal? I'll take it up with Mr. Andrews. Indeed, you, I would. You do that. Well, honey, how are you feeling? Like dancing. Well, come on. <laughs> See that you do it vicariously, Mrs. Bideau. Well, I feel like a cup of coffee. How about you? Unless I'm mistaken, that means you've got something to talk about. That's right. So, I told the company I'd telegraph them a report from Denver. I'd kind of like them to know as soon as possible how we got through the Ute country. All right, how soon do you want me to leave? No, I'd better go myself. I was kind of thinking of going out tonight. Well, why don't you wait in the morning? You're a nosy one, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry? It's a pleasure to travel with you, boy. Thank you. You must be a great satisfaction to Jim Bridger. Well, I hope so. I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for him. What tribe was it killed your parents? I don't know. Jim would never tell me. It's better not to know. I know what tribe it was that killed my wife and children. No matter how many Christian arguments I give myself, I'll know until the day I die. Yeah, well, looking back doesn't do any good. No, it doesn't. And this is no time to be lugubrious. We're past the pesky Utes, and I am riding into Denver tonight. 
I need a few hours alone in the saddle. You'll take over for me? Sure, I'll take over. Thank you. See you in Denver sometime Monday. All right, you'll recognize me because I'll have a couple of hundred wagons behind me. You'd better. I intend to count. <laughs> Where'd you come from? Where I always come from, out yonder. You know, I've been homesick for you ever since I came into these corn sign mountains. <laughs> you look fine, boy. So do you. Well, come on. I thought you were with the army up in the Yellowstone. Well, uh, that's why we're fighting. I mean, you haven't been there yet? Uh, run into them consarn pesky utes. They wipe you out? Well, last we heard, four days ago, we were still holding out. Well, why are you here? Well, I'm escorting General Jameson, a small detachment. Why isn't General Jameson with his men? Because he's a wise old bird who listens to a little advice every now and then. And I bet you're giving it to him. <laughs> Who's heading up to your wagon train now? Oh, Chris Hill has the job. Is that so? Good man. Yes, he is. Mm. Got to have a talk with him. Afraid you'll have to wait a while. He's on his way to Denver. Oh. Well, that's a piece of bad luck. Why? Who do you leave in charge of the outfit? Me? You? Why not? Don't you have any faith in me? I, uh, I were wishing for someone else. Why? Uh, best it don't come from me. Ain't sit and talk to ex father and son. Best come official like. You're in charge of the wagon train, the, uh, General's in charge of the army. Hi, General. Hi, Jim. General Jameson, Glenn McCullough. General? Glad to meet you, Mr. McCullough. Did Mr. Bridger tell you what we need? No, he's been kind of secret about it. Well, the major part of my command, 120 men, is trapped in an ambush back in Ute country about 180 miles. Now, strategically, they're in a good position to hold out as long as their ammunition lasts. I can't leave those men there to die. I've got to have help. I see where your men trapped. Up on Snow Mountain. At the basin at the foot of the ridge? Yeah. That's right. Now, the way we size it up, the men were coming down the mountain when they were attacked. That's an old you trick. They'll wait until your men run out of ammunition, and they'll pick the remains. I took this train 80 miles out of the way to avoid Snow Mountain. Now, we couldn't do that. We're on our way to Yellowstone. I see. You had no choice. Well, Mr. Bridger and I and the men with us went out in a reconnaissance. And when we got back to the outfit, it was dark, and the situation was as I've just described. Now, I was all for fighting our way up the mountain, but Mr. Bridger thought otherwise. You'd have never made it alive. Well, you and Mr. Bridger seem to think alike. I'm not surprised. Well, Mr. Bridger persuaded me that my men would have a better chance if I came after your wagon train for help. I see. 
Well, we've been celebrating getting through that country. I don't know how much help they'll be willing to give you, but uh, I'll ask for volunteers. I'm not asking for volunteers, Mr. McCullough. I'm commandeering this train. What do you mean, commandeering? My men are trapped. I've got to get them out. Well, you can't just hijack it. Hijack is hardly the word. Well, you're Americans, and those are American soldiers back there. Yeah, but 50% of the people on this train are women and children. In a state of war, all civilians are subject to the call of duty. This is hardly a war. When 120 soldiers are fighting for their lives, a state of war exists, no matter what you choose to call it. I said I'd ask for volunteers, General. That's as far as it goes. You know what I'm talking about. Tell him. I brought General Jameson here. Yeah, but you didn't know he was going to do this. I told him to do it. You told him? 120 brave lads. And the buzzards are circling. Would you do nothing to help him? I said I'd ask for volunteers. A show of strength is what's needed the whole train. 200 wagons riding at Snow Mountain. Soldiers up ahead, flags flying. Them engines will think we're riding in with heavy reinforcements. And what if they don't? Time was when you respected my judgment. This has nothing to do with respect. You can't ask me to risk the lives of these people. He's not asking, and I'm not asking. I'm ordering. This is a gamble I've got to take for my men. You're not gambling with human life, not when it's my responsibility. I'm relieving you of that responsibility right now. You'll have to. Sergeant Hogg. Yes, sir. Am I under arrest? If necessary, you will be. Have the personnel of this train assembled immediately. I want to speak to them. Yes, sir. Flynn. Now think a minute. You're looking just one side of the coin. Am I? When you came here last night, you were welcomed like a father. You're still my son. I think I'm a prisoner. You ain't eating? I just can't understand why Bridget do this. I know how you feel, Flint, but you gotta eat. I'm not hungry, Charlie. You've got to eat food to keep them bones glued together. That sergeant's calling all the people together. Huh? Here you go, Bill. I'm not eating today, Charlie. Hmm. You too, huh? You got a way figured to block this thing? I don't think I'm gonna block it. All you have to do is say the word and the whole camp will fight, you know that. Yeah, but I'm not gonna say the word. It might start a mutiny, and it's my job around here to keep the peace. Are we going to the meeting? Yeah, I want to hear what the general has to say. It's your decision. I'll never feel the same about that Jim Bridger. Yeah, me too, Charlie. Our president accounted for, General. This wagon train is now in the service of the United States Army. We're going to the rescue of 120 soldiers caught back in Ute country. Well, it's not right if you've got to tell us what to do. We're not in the Army. We don't have to do it. And why is that? Quiet, quiet! What do you say, McCullough? Are you going to stand for this? Mr. Jameson is a general in the United States Army. I don't respect his methods, but I have to respect his rank. And you should respect it, all of you. This is your country. And your soldiers need your help now. I'm not a brigand or a highwayman. I'm law and order. The thing that you want most of here, 
But we're not soldiers. You are now, ma'am. Every man, woman, and child in this outfit is now a soldier in the army and will be for the next 12 days. I apologize for this inconvenience. Believe me, I regret the necessity far more than you. But understand this. You are offered no choice. In a state of war, the military is in full charge. This gentleman here is Mr. Jim Bridger. Now, for the benefit of any of you who might not know him, the Army considers him the greatest living authority on Indian affairs in the whole country. He's also a great explorer. You all came west by the Overland Trail. Mr. Bridger blazed that trail. You passed by Fort Bridger and you recently came through Bridger's Pass. Now in the next few days, Mr. Bridger is going to be riding at the head of this train. Now that's something you'll be proud to tell your grandchildren one day. That is, if we live to have any grandchildren. Maybe it won't be that bad. Hitch up your teams and be prepared to leave in one hour. Sergeant Hope. Mr. McCullough, don't we have any rights in this? Yeah, we have rights, but not to fight the army. Look. We've got guns, and as far as I can see, we outnumber the soldiers. I say we fight, and I say we don't. You siding with them? You saying we go along with them? Under the circumstances, that's what I'm saying. I forgot. Bridger raised you, didn't he? What has that got to do with it? Sounds to me like it's got a lot to do with it. Well, I can't help how it sounds. McCullough's with them. There's nothing more we can say to him. Come on, folks. Come on, let's pack our gear. Come on. Come on. Things are gonna get pretty edgy. Fletch, you can't blame the people for feeling the way they do. No, you can't. You know, this is like being invited to your own massacre. I never figured Bridger to be a part of a thing like this. You know, I've looked up to him all my life. I figured that they just didn't make men any taller. No, I'm not so sure. Please turn your wagon around, sir. No, I won't. I won't turn my wagon around. I'm sorry, sir. Atkins, turn this wagon. You stay away from that wagon. Sorry, sir. Please turn this wagon, sir. My wife's gonna have a baby. We're not going back to engine country. I'm sorry, sir. You know my orders. The devil with your orders. Are you starting a ruckus, sir? But, mister, maybe you didn't understand me. I said we're not going back. Brown, turn this wagon. No, you don't. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. General's orders. Go ahead, Brown. Turn the wagon. <laughs> Is he dead? No, just done. I'll find my car. Yeah. <laughs> you don't seem to understand, General. Some of the people aren't physically able to make the trip. If I make one exception, I'll have to make a hundred. What about Mrs. Badeau? She could have her baby at any time. It's not human to move her. It isn't human to take any of you. Her husband is young and able. I need him. I see. And what about the Elliott boy? I'll have the Army surgeon look at him. Captain Fox is better than any you'll find in Denver. I always thought that the Army was sent out here to protect the people, not sacrifice them. 
I'm not going to argue any longer. I'd advise you to keep your people in order. Any insubordination will be harshly dealt with. You capture this wagon train. Don't ask me to help you run it. I won't need your help. You might need this much. It's a long train. I wouldn't turn my back on a single wagon. Flint! Flint! Jen, you do your job on that boy. In his shoes, I'd be saying the same things, and maybe not as politely. Well, I reckon each of us does his duty as he sees it. Sometimes the cost is kind of high. I'm sorry it turned out to be his train. I know what McCullough means to you. Took you to be about uh, eight years old when I found him. A little red-headed sprout trying to dig a grave for his ma and pa. I'll never forget the look on his face that day. Weren't crying. They were mad. Had himself a powerful, strong anger even then. And when I finished the graves, I said, uh, reckon I found me a son. That's the way it was. Never no trouble twixt us. Never. All them years. He'll cool down. You don't ask me why. I expect that's what troubles me most. You don't give me a chance to tell him why. sundown tomorrow. How long then? Uh, bar and accidents, uh, three days journey. Three days? If my men hold out that long. Colonel Stacy's no campaigner. He'll ration the food and the ammunition. Jim, he doesn't even know help's on the way. That old war horse will hope right down to the last bullet. We better keep moving just as fast as we can. Wrong. Come on. Flint! Hold up! Oh! That's 
Hands up. Here's your wagon. Broke a wheel. About 50 wagons hung up behind it. They put new wheels on that wagon just last week. Must not put them on right. What, are they fixing it? Not now. He ain't. He's unloading his wagon. Unloading the wagon? Yeah, he's looking for two. You must think that Jamison's pretty stupid. <laughs> What's the trouble? Breakdown in the fifth section, about 50 wagons held up. A legitimate breakdown? A wheel came off a wagon. You can't run a wagon on three wheels, General. Here's like we best stop here for Noonan. Don't you think it's a little early, Mr. Bridger? General Jameson, the way I figure it, we better send some soldiers down there to fix them wagons, unless we want to sit here for quite a spell. That the way you see it, Flint? Yep, that's the way I see it. Sign of Indians? No, not yet. People behaving? Sulking, doing whatever they can to hold us up. General Jameson? Yes, yeah, sir. Three more wagons report their loads up shifted, and we'll have to repack. That blast their on hides. That could cost us a whole day. If they want to play tough, we'll play with them. Pass the order, we'll stop here for repairs. And tell McCullough to come to my wagon immediately. Yes, sir. You tell the general that I'm busy, Sergeant. Sir, the general wants to see you immediately. Well, I don't want to see him immediately or any other time. You just tell him I'm busy. Sir, my orders were to tell you to come to his wagon immediately. Yeah, do you have an alternative? Do you bring me in dead or alive? I'll have to ask the general for an alternative, sir. You do that, Sergeant. McCullough's sergeants are downright mean. They're all alike. I've never met one in my life that wasn't a mean. Can you just fix the chow, please? Yes, sir, Mr. McCullough. Right away. Yes, sir. You sure have that coffee ready yet? Had to get the water, didn't I? Well, if you don't hurry up, we won't have time to eat lunch. I only got two hands and two feet. Yeah, and you got two heads. So I'm going to take this saddle down to the Weber wagon, and when I come back, I want that chow ready. That's what you get paid for. You're going to be a mean old man someday. Now, there's a living example of an ex-sergeant. Huh. I'm going to get myself a job with a new wagon train next door. This outfit is getting too cranky for me. Mr. McCullough. Mr. Bridger tells me that we're getting close to Snow Mountain. Do you agree with that? It would be presumptuous for me to disagree with Mr. Bridger, don't you think? My soldiers are taking care of the latest rash of breakdowns. I'm getting sick and tired of these tactics. I've ordered Sergeant Hogue to pass the word down the line that the driver of the next wagon who holds us up faces arrest, 20 lashes and possible fine and imprisonment. I don't think you mean it, General. I do mean it. Believe me, I mean it. I wouldn't push the people too far. I don't care if they hate me. I've got 120 men caught in a death trap. They've been there 11 days. Time's running out. Threats won't speed up the train, and neither will bluffing. And you'd better make it dead blame clear that I'm not bluffing. This isn't a war of nerves between them and me. This is an effort to save a company of men. Every hour lost may mean the life of a man or 120 men. What kind of people are they? Must they be whipped like naughty children before they do what's right? No, they're not children, but they're not soldiers either. They're ordinary people and they think independently. They make up their own minds about what's right and wrong. And they resent taking orders with a gun in their back. 
They're free citizens, General. And they've got very strong opinions about the rights of free citizens. They figure the Army's supposed to protect those rights, not take them away. I've got to have help. I always thought that help was something that was given. I didn't know. Yes, sir. That's a load on it. Yes, sir. I told you. No sign of them pesky Utes. The way I figure it, they're all at Snow Mountain. Any more breakdowns? No, no incidents this morning. Except for a few pot shots at my men. Well, we dashed and had no shots. We can't let them engines know we're here. Very well, Mr. Bridger. There'll be no more shots. I'm getting sick and tired of darning. Darning is a woman's work. All I do all day long is cook and wash and sew. And what do I get out of it? Huh. Why don't you be quiet? Complaint, that's all. Never a kind word. Shoulder the blame, Charlie. Work your fingers to the bone. Slave over a hot stove all day. <laughs> Charlie, I'm trying to think. Yeah, and you'll be sorry when I'm gone, too. Yeah, but you're still here. And if you'd have bought new canvas to begin with, I wouldn't have all this darning to do. You better be quiet about that canvas. Oh, thin-skinned and touchy, huh? Can't stand a little criticism. Everything you do has got to be perfect. Everything I do has got to be wrong. Bill, what are you going to do? Don't touch me. I'm little than you. Bill! Bill! I'll cut it out! Bill! 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 Now maybe you'll cool down a little bit. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Let it I'll go, kill him. Charlie. Let it go. There's no time for you two to be clowning around. I know, Clint. I'm sorry. I know we've got to act normal, all of us. Well, you do a pretty good job. Maybe you better put on some dry clothes. Have you talked to Jim yet? No. You going to? I doubt it. Why not? Because I got nothing to say to him. Prove it, huh? Well, um, tell you what. You bring me a grizzly bar and I'll whoop it. Honest engine? Honest engine. I don't know that that's so much. Davy Crockett could do that. Not with one foot on Flagstaff Mountain, other on Boulder Ridge. And David Crockett, he had a grizzly bear for a pet. Yeah. Well, you know, that, uh, that Davy Crockett, he was some fella. I remember one time him and me had a contest down the Arkansas River. I said, uh, Davy, let's settle this thing once and for all. And so we each plunked down a brand new shiny dollar. And Davy, he bends over and he picks up a mountain lion under each arm. And then he takes himself a run and jump and he lands clear across on the other side of the Arkansas River. Standing up straight, never even lost his balance. And then he just stood there looking at me. See, he was waiting to see what I was going to do. Wow! There ain't no way to beat that. Oh, I don't mind telling you. 
he had me stumped there for a minute. <laughs> yeah. But I wasn't going to give up that silver dollar without a fight of some kind. So I says, uh, David, let me see them lines. And so I reached out across the Arkansas and grabbed each one of them babies by the tail and hauled them back across the river. By the tail? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's the best way to get a good hold on a lion, you know, by the tail. And so then I started whirling them around my head, you know, one one way, one double. When I got them whirling good, let's go. And away they went, way up into the sky. You know, them lions never come down till they was across the Canadian border, and they never did come back. <laughs> <laughs> and then old Davy, he stood on the other side there, laughing and laughing and laughing. People around thought they was hearing thunder. And then he hollers out to me, and he says, Jim, you keep the dollar. It was worth the cartwheel to me just to see the look on them lions' faces. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bridger, were you born in the mountains? No. No, I, I, uh, I never was born. Oh, one day there was a big thunderstorm, and a boat come out to the sky, and it landed plunk alongside of my daddy's cabin. And I walked out of that thunderbolt, full grown, with a saw of tobacco in my hand. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, time was when I used to tell that story to another little boy in the long, long ago. What happened to the little boy? Well, uh, he grew up. Grew up. Tony? Jimmy? Yes, ma'am. Bye, Mr. Bye, Bridger. Mr. Bridger. Bye, boys. Come back, see me again. Kind of lonesome around here. Right on moving, Mr. McCullen. We'll both feel better. Oh, great, don't. Doesn't help. That's right. You figure McCullough sold us out for friendship or money? You don't really mean that. I'm doing the best I can. It happens everyone on this train doesn't agree with that. Is that so? Yes, that's so. Your soldier friends got the jump on us back there, thanks to you. Well, we may even things up yet. Don't start anything. This place is crawling with engines. Save your advice, McCullough. This wagon train's had about a belly full of it. You heard what I said. Don't start anything. Gray. You better go in, Mavis. The air has turned bitter. He doesn't mean all he's saying. Come on in, Mavis. Someone might see us talking to McCullough and get the idea we're still friends. Don't worry about it. Mr. McCullough? What is it, Sergeant? I'm instructed by General Jameson to collect all firearms. Get the rifles. Wait a minute. What are we going to do if we're attacked? My orders are to fire on anyone who refuses to obey the order. Mr. McCullough, I regret very much having to order these men to fire. Give it to him, Charlie. Thank you. You tell General Jameson that if we're attacked, it'll be a massacre. Colonel Jameson's not afraid of an attack. Then he's a fool. 
You'll get your guns back at the proper time. I ain't been without my gun since I was born. I feel naked. <laughs> what do you suppose will happen to us? Where does the army get off taking our guns? They took ours, too. They can't get away with this. We're a new country. Well, you better tell General Jameson he's running this train. You're supposed to be in charge of this outfit. Not at the moment, I'm not. As far as Chris Hale's concerned, you are. Well, Chris Hale isn't here, and I'm doing the best I know how. You know, the people aren't speaking to me down the line, Flint. They think we're part of this. I think we ought to set them straight. That might mean a mutiny. Maybe that's what we ought to have. Maybe we should have done that in the first place. That would show our position to every youth in the territory. Well, I'm not sure we can stop a mutiny. Maybe not. But you ought to walk down the line and see how popular you are right now. I'm not out here to win a popularity contest. I'm trying to save this train. Well, the way to save it is to get back control. That's for me to decide. Maybe you can't decide. Maybe the people are right. Maybe you're too close to Jim Bridger to see the truth of things. Maybe. This is Bedeau. Let's go. I guess it's her time. Captain Fox is a doctor. He's at your service. No, you stay away from my wife. It's your fault that we're here. That's not important now. You stay out of this. What matters now is your wife. Don't be a fool. Let the doctor go in. I brought many a baby into the world, young man. Please help her, Doc. Please. All right, you folks, that isn't the first baby we've had on the trail. Charlie, you get the water boiling. Anything you need, ladies, you just tell us. We aren't going any farther today, are we? I don't know. That's up to General Jameson. How about it, General? Well, it's three more hours of daylight. We'll get another start tomorrow. All right, folks, we camp right here. Thanks, General. I hate new coffee pots. It takes a year to make them taste like a coffee pot again. You notice any change down the line? Well, I'm not sure, Flint. At least the people are starting to say hello again. That's some encouragement. You know, there's a bunch of young fellows gathering over the KO wagon. Well, we can't stop them from gathering. That might really set them off. Yeah, but we better keep our eyes on them. They want their guns. Well, so do we. What's the matter with you, anyway? Every time a baby's born in this wagon train, I get nervous. That's why. why. You're not the mom or the pop, are you? Well, I'm the Uncle Wooster. You sure are, Charlie, every time. What if I have a boy or a girl? Who knows? You might have both. Hey, that's an idea. I never had twins before. <laughs> Where are you going, Flint? Well, I'm going to go to the general. Snow them out tomorrow? Yep. Are we going to fight them? Your guess is as good as mine, Charlie. General? Jim. Well, I'm off to get myself a look at them pesky Utes. Be back for sun up. In the name of God, man, you be careful. General, uh, uh, them engines never got me yet. Maybe not. But I'm uneasy tonight. Well, I, uh, I've known considerable generals in my time, and, uh, every single one of them was uneasy for a battle. Mr. Bircher, the Army owes you more than it can ever repay. For that matter, the whole country does. And I consider myself fortunate to count you among my friends. Well, I'm coming back. 
You talk like you was telling me goodbye. You look pure tuckered out. A couple hours of sleep will make everything look brighter. Maybe so. See you before sunup. Well, see that you do, Mr. Bridger. See that you do. seen him for the last time. Well, it's the night of the battle. That's what he said. How can two people who think so much alike become divided? I guess because we have divided responsibilities. I don't like this feeling. I have half a notion to send after him. He wouldn't come. He's going to scout Snow Mountain. You've talked then? No. But nobody has to tell me where Bridger went tonight. You've held all this against him. He didn't know you were in command of this train. When he found out, it didn't change anything. I'm the one that took the train to command his mind. This shouldn't come between you and him. I came to ask if your plans are the same for tomorrow. If they are, are you going to cooperate? I offered you my help in the beginning. I didn't approve of bringing women and children then, and I still don't. But we're here, and I'd like to know what's expected of us. If nothing's changed, the Indians are camped at the foot of the mountain. I want you to line your wagons up abreast. I'm going to put the cavalrymen out front, flags and bugles, and we'll charge those Indians. Now, if we put on a good enough show, they'll think half the army's with us. Now, panic and scatter. That'll give my men a chance to get down the hill. Those men on the mountain are soldiers. They faced danger and death before. They're not strangers to it. And if they survive tomorrow, they'll meet it again. But they chose this life. It's their job. Remember that these people... I know. Your words have enough for me. I captured settlers and pioneers and brought them out here at gunpoint to do a soldier's job. Now, maybe I didn't have the right to do it. I've been in the army since I was a boy. I suppose I've just lost sight of the gentle ways of doing things. You've given me something to think about. I'll tell you that. Well, you've given me something to think about, too, General. I lost sight of the fact that soldiering and pioneering go hand in hand, and one hand sort of helps the other. I've ordered your guns return. I'm going to apologize to these people. I'm going to tell them my plan and ask their help. Pray to God they give it to me. 120 lives. A whole company of men. That sounds like the new arrival. Mr. Bedeau. Come on, let's find out. Full of comings and goings. A child is sent. And a man is taken. It's always hail and farewell. Well, the gun's been taken out of our backs, trains in our hands, and we're free to move. But before we pull out in the morning, we've got a decision to make. And we should try and make it without any bitterness, if we can. As you know, for the last several days, General Jamison and I have had two points of view. And I suppose we're both right. That is, depending on how you look at it. 
But I'm sure there are more than two points of view on anything, and before we make a decision, I think, even though Mr. Bridger and I don't always agree with each other, I think we ought to hear what he's got to say. Well, <clears throat> I got an axe to grind. I thought I'd be the first to tell you. I come through this uh, country when uh, it not safe for no white man to travel sitting on his belly. Uh, that way I got a real close look at the good black earth around here and the uh, green things growing. And I commenced thinking of the people back east, all closed in with the smokestacks and cement. How good to be for them out here. And pretty soon the wagon started to come in. For quite a spell there, it seemed more folks died of coming than got where they was going. And then the army uh, begun sending in help. It weren't always war and how us uh, mountain men felt they ought to, but well. And you folks wouldn't have got as far as you have if it weren't for a lot of battles being fought and a lot of good men dying before you got here. The army brung law and order to the West. Now, it ain't reasonable to get all that protecting and then to go right on through and forget about it. Everything is by way of having a price and you should ought to pay your share. Now the army come to the West to make it safe. Hmm. The way I figure it, they got a right to a helping hand from them that they're keeping safe. Could you turn this train around, go away, leave them men up there in the mountain to get murdered? I don't think there's a single one of you would sleep at nights if you was to do it. It seems to me that, that Mr. Bridger makes a lot of sense. But it's up to you folks to make the decision. So take a vote. And we'll either turn around and head back for California, or we'll go on to Snow Mountain. It's up to you.
haven't exactly seen eye to eye these last few days. Nothing wrong with the way you were seeing things. Only way you could see him do your job. I could have seen him go away. I mean, I should realize that everybody out here sort of has to help everybody. I live considerable more years than you and got hindsight. Hindsight comes with the years. When I was your age, guiding folks west, I only thought of the ones I was responsible for, too. And these uh, later years, I come to think of all of the wagon trains, all of the army commands as one, one large group of Americans going west into history. Isn't that rain, we? Appears to me I've been doing considerable speechifying these last few hours. Well, it won't hurt me to listen. A fellow once said to me that a man should never be too old to learn. I expect that fellow was right. Take care of yourself. You too. Aren't on a little tadpole. See ya.